Welcome to Enlightened Society. Today we have special guest Stephen Gray, who's written a book called Cannabis and Spirituality. Stephen Gray is the author of other books that we'll talk about. We're sitting here in Oregon where cannabis is legal. Uh, and it's somewhat surreal to walk into a store uh, where they have the best cannabis in the entire world, uh, dozens of varieties with lots known about them. And uh, it wasn't so long ago where they put people in jail here. And of course they still do. A lot of us think about cannabis as recreational and very few of us know about its consciousness related aspects and so that's one of the main things we're here to talk about today so Stephen welcome thank you what do uh, what do you like to tell people who have never heard of you what do you like to tell them about mm. about yourself that they might like to know oh okay um, well perhaps for the purposes of this work uh, that I have been involved in one way or another with uh, psychedelics or as I often prefer to call them entheogens for many years um, beginning actually in my uh, youth uh, perhaps late teens early 20s I had a fair amount of experience with LSD in particular and a few others uh, as well as cannabis although neither I nor very few people that any, or you know very many people that I knew of if any thought of cannabis as an entheogen or a spiritual plant particularly um, at that time. Um, so I've been around them a lot. I had a period where I was away from them. I suppose one one thing that I maybe would like people to know, uh, if they are interested in that, uh, that I've always been involved with some kind of spiritual community or practice, um, like a serial monogamist in some sense that way. Me too. Um, uh, I, uh, there, was a <clears throat> there was a theme uh, theme, what's the word, a meme perhaps, uh, going around uh, amongst my generation. So when I say my generation, perhaps I should clarify, uh, I'm w one of those uh, baby boomers, they call them, um, that, that period of people who were born in the 10 to 15 years after World War II, you know. And uh, so it was a really interesting time because a huge number of people, a large bulge in the, in, in the population, all came of age at the same time. because. You know, people came home and started uh, reproducing like rabbits after the war, you know, um, and that continued for some time. So uh, a whole bunch of uh, forces uh, kind of came together in the mid to late 1960s. Uh, this large number of people, uh, an increasing awareness of the sort of emptiness of material culture um, and the fear that was associated with that. You know, we'd come out of the 50s, which was, you know, the communist fears and, you know, House on American Activities Committee and all those sort of things. So um, there was this, an explosion of expansion at that time, and uh, it, in, uh, it included a, 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 a very rapidly developing interest among certain segments of this, what were, was called the counterculture at the time. Uh, we never used the word hippies, by the way. That was the word that the quote-unquote straights would sometimes use derogatorily to describe these, you know, uh, uh, you know, long-haired, freaky people. You know, and in fact, uh, I'm getting a little, you know, off topic here, but I'll keep it brief. Um, uh, w we often referred to ourselves as freaks, which was kind of like black people. Um, using the word nigger to describe themselves. It's like you take the, the, the derogatory language that they used and you, and you turn it into a positive. So from our, atti our attitude was, yes, we are freaks to your culture, but your t culture, you know, is problematic, you know, <laughs> to put it politely. Um, so anyway, I got very interested in both the spiritual, the, the spirituality mo was focused uh, much more toward um, Asia than it was toward Christianity. Um, or, or Islam for that matter either um, although Christianity was included as well uh, and that dovetailed with this interest in the psychedelics um, so I've always had that interest I let it go for quite a while because um, one of the memes I was going to mention a few moments ago was uh, okay so you've had perhaps some opening experience now what do you do with it 
and the the answer that people seem to absorb was well you have to turn it into a daily practice of some kind you can't be taking psychedelics all the time you know um, so for a lot of people that was meditation of some kind or another for me that became Buddhism so I got very involved with Tibetan Buddhism for quite a number of years um, and just put that stuff on the back burner for a while and and then it was actually Terence McKenna you were asking me before we turned on the recorder I believe you know that you said you might ask me about some of my quote-unquote heroes and although you know I think all heroes have clay feet to some degree um, as far as being um, influential in my life Terence McKenna was uh, because when I first came upon his material uh, I kind of had this aha moment where I realized oh okay yes there is actually a thousands of years history of people using these substances uh, spiritually which was not well understood at all by my generation back in the late 60s and early 70s um, so uh, that was like okay yes there's a linkage there and then I became reinterested and I don't want to take up too much of the time to go through the rest of my history but one thing led to another which connected me to the conference you might have mentioned in the introduction that I co-organized the spirit plant medicine conference in Vancouver and that connected me to a quite a lot of quite a few really interesting people and one of those was Kathleen Harrison I mentioned last night in the talk that she was kind of the trigger for me to get going on this because she offered to contribute to what she thought would be a very important book and uh, so that was a five-year project that resulted in the publication of this book uh, recently uh, just to make sure people understand uh, clearly I'm not the author per se I mean I'm, that, that isn't my primary designation for the book I'm the editor and I'm one of 18 contributors to the book and also another minor correction uh, if people actually go looking for me um, uh, they will find that I've written one other book not several just to clarify and it's called Returning to Sacred World which I uh, pub was published about seven years ago so um, yeah if anyone is interested in my personal history it's just been one of uh, of attempting to understand uh, and heal and wake up for my whole life essentially uh, yes I was probably including uh, a lot of the stuff you've done uh, I think you mentioned you were interested in art is that right uh, you you create various uh, artistic uh, things music music um, mm -hmm. although not doing much of that anymore um, I had a period uh, from the uh, mid 90s until around 2008 where I was uh, quite actively uh, composing uh, multi-track music that was mostly instrumental kind of ambient using you know computer multi-track uh, recording programs and so on so I did three CDs of that in about a I don't know 10 year period or so uh, and then I just kind of ran out of steam with it at one point and also I was selling CDs so the CD market uh, just fell through the floor essentially around about that time as we know very few people <laughs> spend money on CDs anymore so that dovetailed with a sort of running out of some inspiration to do the same kind of music anymore so I don't really do much of that anymore I still have people can still find those it's actually under the name Kiri K-E-A-R-Y is the artist name for that and there's a website kiri Reed Song, R-E-E-D-S-O-N-G dot com that, that uh, people can find out about that music um, I don't do anything other particularly oh pardon me um, I'm very interested in photography uh, I wouldn't consider myself a professional uh, however, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about it uh, whenever I can get a chance to go out. I like outdoor photography, landscape, different things like that. And I did do a three-year uh, uh, diploma or accredited program through the New York Institute of Photography about three, four years ago on that. So I have some skills in that area. And it's one of those uh, little things that are sort of sitting on the the second burner back there waiting to see if I will actually take it further or not. I, I keep having a fantasy about, you know, maybe one of these days I'll, you know, frame a bunch of these things and have some shows and put them online and all that. So far, um, it hasn't got, it hasn't quite got up to first priority with this other work with the cannabis and the spirituality work and so on. So we'll see about that one. Well, before we move off of history, uh, yeah. Briefly talk about uh, the late 60s, early 70s for you. What uh, kind of mm. what were you doing? Uh, what were you aware of? Mm. Uh, well, uh, for anyone who's sort of interested in culture and the development of uh, 
you know, kind of spiritual evolution, I suppose you could say, it really was a, a, a remarkable time. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, if I were 22 now, how I would feel about this time, you know, because I'm at a different stage of life, so I can't make a direct comparison. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, a number of forces all combined at the same time in a very unusual way, not least of which, as I mentioned, was a, a huge bulge in the democratic curve uh, of people all coming to age at the same time, uh, you know, coming into sort of, when I say age, 18, 19, 20 kind of thing. Uh, it, uh, um, it, it, well, in North America at least, and uh, some countries in Europe, Western Europe in particular, like France and England perhaps, uh, Germany perhaps, and some others maybe, there was, um, well, especially in North America, from the end of World War II until about the mid-1960s, there had been 20 years of no wars that directly involved us, other than what, you know, our leaders were doing in foreign places sometimes. I mean, the Vietnam War was getting going. But until the mid-60s, uh, there, you know, most, pe most young people weren't in directly involved, and nobody was attacking Canada or the United States directly, right? So there'd been this period of, uh, you know, relative peace on the planet and a an really unprecedented period of material wealth. The people that came out of the war also had just finished coming out of the, the Great Depression. So they'd had World War I from 1914 to 18, and, and then uh, there was a, you know, brief 10-year period there in the 20s of, of some prosperity, but then the Depression kicked in in 29 and, and, and didn't end until the beginning of World War II. And that was a period of deprivation, even for people in North America, because you know a lot of the resources were going to the war effort. You know, you know my my parents remember, um, you know, rationing of gas and butter and you know all these kind of staples. You know, so here comes this generation that's had now 20, 20 years roughly of security, of relative security, and uh, wealth um, and opportunity. You know, that's one thing that's changed since then. That. Uh, you know, you could goof off for a while and feel like you could still, you know, come back into the workforce, no problem, you know. Um, in Canada, as at least, I don't know quite what it was like here, uh, unemployment benefits were pretty generous and you only needed to work for about eight weeks before you could, you know, ap apply for... You know. <laughs> I knew people that, that uh, skied all winter and they, they were so cocky about it that they had actually printed up t-shirts that said the UI ski team, uh, UI meant unemployment insurance, you know. So they were just sort of saying, hey, we're taking the winter off and skiing. We're not even looking for a job like we're supposed to be, you know. So uh, in other words, there was a period of uh, sort of security and this, uh, you know, newfound level of wealth in the middle classes in particular, obviously. Uh, and that's where the, the countercultural people primarily came from anyway, um, where they started to go, oh, my parents' generation was so buttoned down and so conformist, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good, it feels empty, you know? Um, and at the same time, and also um, a great stimulus to that start, that shift that was uh, occurring, was the um, uh, expansion of the use of cannabis and uh, LSD and some other, you know, psychedelics at the time, which uh, shocked a bunch of minds open as well, you know. Um, uh, so, so all those things dovetailed together, a discovery of uh, uh, that the entheogens um, uh, triggered the awareness that there was something a lot bigger and more uh, permanent somehow than what was going on in our lives, and especially those of our parents' generation. You know, there's some, there's, there was a book that came out in the 50s called The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, which kind of almost like sums up the 50s for a lot of people, like conformism, safety, fear of other, you know, all these kind of things, material focus. And it was, again, because of that generation that this, you know, they got, they hunkered down, they made the money. And then our generation came along and went, you guys don't look very happy to us. You know, you're pretty, you know, tightly bound in a lot of ways. And all these factors came together. Um, I was, well, Canada, Canada was a little slower to, California was kind of the, you know, the leading edge of that, and then it sort of, you know, osmosed its way through the rest of the United States and up into Canada. So, you know, by the time uh, Haight-Ashbury was uh, over, essentially, in 1967, I was just starting to get the message, really, you know, because I was in a suburban town in Ontario, 
near Toronto, which was kind of uh, you know deep in the heart of uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant you know country. So it took a while, but once I got onto it, I got really excited about all that. Um, just this explosion of uh, you know much more expansive visionary ideas. You know, yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, mean, I think we have other things to talk about. So I don't want don't want to go on too long about well, it was that. a perfect yeah. segue yeah. to uh, topic of consciousness. Yeah. Um, I've heard it talked about how uh, we're in a space where we've now colonized the planet, mm -hmm. and so we no longer can explore the planet in the same way that people have been mm -hmm. able to for yes. all of history. Yeah. But we're too early to explore. The cosmos mm. uh, and I think uh, 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 an ad additional aspect to that is the exploration of consciousness mm -hmm. to me that is really the final frontier mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, yeah talk a little bit about um, your thoughts about consciousness in general and then we'll get into details I, I can lead you Sure. into something if if you like Absolutely, but um, yeah. I, my next uh, topic I was going to talk about is your book uh, returning to the sacred world sure uh, maybe you could talk about it in relation to that well I'll answer your question about consciousness first uh, um, uh, you know I don't consider myself an authority on anything like that and I'm not an academic I want to make that clear uh, I'm just a, a you know a, a person who's been on the path for 50 years or so you know and uh, so um, I guess the simplest way to put that that's sort of you know user friendly as it were is that uh, I, I like talking about it the way that Buddhists talk about it because I spend all that time studying and practicing Buddhism and I like the way that Buddhists talk about this. The Buddha, the word Buddha itself actually means just translates as awake or the awakened one or something like that. And so um, Buddha nature means awakened nature. And what the Buddha taught was that everybody has that nature. And if you don't experience your life yourself that way, it's, it's not because it isn't there. It's because you've layered it over with a whole bunch of narratives and stories and physical binding and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you've obscured it, as I was talking about in the event last night, uh, the, the thinking mind creates this veil like the octopus's, you know, ink cloud thing that comes out, you know. And actually, it's interesting that uh, the the only uh, Terence McKenna. This was a good one. I like this. Terence McKenna said that the octopus could be the, um, the what's the word? Like not the mascot. There's another word I can't remember. Like the almost uh, um, uh, emblem for the future, so to speak. Because the octopus, you see its emotions because it changes color, so it's not hidden. Um, and the only way that can ever obscure itself is uh, by sending out this ink cloud. And it only does that when it's afraid. So I think that's a really interesting kind of image or metaphor that uh, uh, there's underneath the cloud, um, behind the cloud, um, uh, we could, if you want to talk more later about, uh, a little bit more about my experience with Buddhism, my teacher was Chugyam Trungpa, a Tibetan master. And uh, he used an image or metaphor of a cocoon, and that's the, what we call the ego, you know, where we build these layers of protection and keep ourselves inside it to, to, to feel safe. So um, if you can find how to um, allow the cocoon to dissolve, because the cocoon requires constant maintenance. It's not like it's just going to be there. Uh, you act we actually ego is synonymous with struggle and so we're constantly trying to ward off uh, he the same teacher also said that enlightenment is a is actually a constant irritation to the ego mind uh, it in a sense never leaves you alone so that's reality is that sort of flow as it were you know the moving energy and um, we have to be actively avoiding it and that's what humans essentially do, is actively avoid being enlightened or being awake. So the spiritual path, uh, or what matters to me about consciousness, is that we are all capable of allowing the cocoon to dissolve, of uh, allowing um, ourselves to relax. You know? um, on, on one level, you might even say the whole of the spiritual uh, uh, teaching or path is relax, you know, like learn to let go 
um, because that requires the trust that's beyond ego, the trust in our own intelligence. That's another Buddhist thing. They talk about unconditional intelligence that you um, uh, that manifests, that becomes uncovered as you let go and relax all these control mechanisms that we have. There was a sounds slightly tan tangential, but it's not really. There was an author, I believe his name was Hubert Selby Jr., who wrote a book called uh, Last Exit to Brooklyn. Back in the 50s, was a very popular book. He then went into something like 30 years of heroin addiction. And when he came out of it, he said, uh, the one thing that I understood, the one thing that I learned, was that control is the problem. You know, that we're always trying to control ourselves and control the world around us, you know. Um, so, so that to me is what's important about uh, understanding consciousness is that, you know, with all its multiple vari variegations, etc., everybody is ultimately capable of uh, allowing the illusion, illusionary cocoon and uh, protective narrative, you know, collection of stories, etc., to dissolve. Um, it's not as easy as it might sound from me saying that, of course, because it takes up courage, it takes perseverance, it takes trust. Um, it, it, it generally, at some point or another, or some points or another, is also going to require um, uh, facing your own demons. You know, uh, you can't pretend that you know no one's no one gets off easy in a sense. Was, uh, I think Jack Cornfield, one of the Buddhist contemporary Buddhist teachers of North America, said, you know, we have to face the the, uh, the the seven deadly sins in ourselves with capital letters like capital G greed you know <laughs> stuff like that so uh, Christian mystics have sometimes referred to it as the dark night of a soul you know I don't know if there's one you know kind of period like that maybe it's for different people different times where you have to go through certain more difficult bumpy rides you know uh, but we're all capable of Waking up is the basic core teaching, and that's to me what's important about understanding consciousness. You know, I'm not interested in the intellectual pursuit of, of understanding consciousness. I'm interested in its practical application in people's lives. Well, that brings us to tools, mm. tools, tools in the tool bag for um, deepening consciousness, for yes. broadening it, for expanding it, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll get to cannabis as a tool in a moment. Sure. I think one of the things we as a species, as a society, have been grappling with for a couple of thousand years is which tool to use, when to use it, how to mm -hmm. use it, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And each of the religions have uh, grabbed on to certain tools, and each of um, e each of our cultures have uh, developed certain tools. And I think one of the main parts of the 21st century is uh, a unification of the tools, uh, using all of them uh, at the proper times and in the proper um, combinations. Mm -hmm. um, the most profound one, the most simple one, at the same time the most difficult one, meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, just being able to sit quietly alone mm -hmm. in a room. Yeah. Uh, and the power of the of the potential in that at, over time yeah. and that is one of the downfalls is over time uh, a, a Buddhist uh, proper Buddhist monk will, a master will tell you to go sit on a rock for 10 years yeah. uh, and then so we have all kinds of other ones we have yoga we have exploration of the senses uh, film, mm -hmm. uh, music, sound, all kinds of beats, that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, uh -huh. so, many op uh, so, many, so many options. And cannabis, w let's talk quite a bit about cannabis and um, its potential. Cannabis is one of those plants that, it's one of those tools that breaks through most of the boundaries very quickly and it also is so um, it's so subtle that the mind consciousness can go back and forth into kind of what we call ordinary reality and more of a uh, uh, more of an alert uh, conscious reality and 
it gives us the opportunity to really study ourselves. Indeed. And so yeah, yeah. here is one of the primary reasons for putting this book together. Mm-hmm. Um, just, yes. just off the top of your head, talk a little bit about your thoughts on, sure. on this and how it relates to your book. Um, do you mind if I back up slightly to your previous question about the like. different methods there sure. that you've talked about? Because um, uh, I just want to speak a little bit about meditation practice first uh, because the way that the basic kind of follow the breath meditation techniques were taught to me was that it's it's not it almost shouldn't be thought of as a spiritual practice Uh, it's not meant to be thought of as exotic or special or holy or spiritual Um, and in fact it's the least amount of technique that you could apply to just being present it just because most of us because we're moving around and doing things and just we don't you know really know how to work with our minds it's it's beneficial to sit down shut up and pay attention in a sense so that you actually you know see things arising and falling away and you be fall, falling away and you begin to hopefully anyway over time you begin to realize that um, you're not driven blindly and uh, unconsciously by whatever you know narrative is primary in your mind at that time whether it's an intense emotion of anger or sorrow or you know happiness or anything uh, or a storyline you've got about you know why this person did you wrong or you know whatever it might be there's a million stories in the naked city right Uh, um, uh, so just sitting down with the absolute least amount of uh, um, adding anything to that is uh, a way to uh, focus your attention so that you're wa- you're seeing your mind. So, so things come up, emotions come up, thoughts come up. You just let it come up. You see it there and let it go. So that you begin to realize again, hopefully, that over time you are not that. You know that's coming up. These are insubstantial, um, temporary experiences that, that don't have to rule our lives. And we begin to, again, hopefully, discover that underneath that is something ineffable. You know, that there's something, uh, there's, a, there's a, an awareness. And again, this is Buddha nature, you know, that, that we're uncovering it. You know, we're gradually removing the onion skin layers from it and discovering that it's there. So, you know, the reason that uh, Buddhists, for example, in particular, have taught and encouraged that kind of simple meditation is for that reason that it just you know it's it's the simplest clearest least complicated thing you can do of course you know buddhists and many other traditions also have had other particular practices for particular reasons etc etc but i wanted to stress that one because i think that is the core of it all it's like uh, the, 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 the real core of, of spiritual awakening involves us to empty ourselves out of the stories and um, just be present, be as empty as possible, uh, at least for part of our time, you know, so that we can uh, start recognizing that we actually are Buddha, you know, that we actually are enlightenment, uh, are enlightened, I mean. Uh, so that's a really useful technique, but as you said, you know, the the guru is going to say, well, go sit on a rock for 10 years. So in reality, what's happened in the West, at least, is that people have found that to be a very slow path for the most part, you know. And so when the psychedelics came along, the entheogens came along, people started recognizing that you could potentially, first of all, you would have openings that you most people weren't having at all through meditation, right? So people were having these openings. Then, of course, it became the issue of what do you do with it that I mentioned earlier in the conversation. So you still need to have an ongoing way to keep the channels open and keep opening the channels. And also, as they talk about in the psychedelic world, integration, you know, integrating these powerful experiences. So you have these um, entries into these uh, deeper, perhaps truer, you know, ineffable, you know, unconditional or unconditioned kinds of uh, states and experiences. And then you have to... Uh, find ways to keep growing and also to bring the insights back from them. Uh, then getting on to your question about cannabis in particular, it's, uh, it's in some ways very different from the other entheogens. Uh, 
it might seem to be less powerful, and it often is, of course. Uh, you know, if you take a sizable uh, belt of uh, ayahuasca medicine, you know, un except in rare cases, it's going to grab you by the scruff of the neck, and that can take you, you know, whether you want to go or not. Whereas cannabis, you can actually kind of dance around it most of the time. I mean, unless it's extremely high dose or oral ingestion, etc. So, um, you know, it's a different kind of a plant that way. It's not particularly focused on the visual, although it can be, of course. It's really, as I was mentioning in the talk, uh, I think overall a retraining of our minds to realize this ability to pay attention in the now, in the moment, and uh, trust the unconditional intelligence of our full presence. So we link, the more calm we are, the more uh, that intelligence can rise, the more that we allow, can allow a gap in that thinking mind, settle down, be on the earth sort of, uh, the more that that can happen. There's a story, probably apocryphal, but I, I still like it. <laughs> The, the Buddha was once asked, um, how do you know you're enlightened? This is, the story goes that he sat under a... He, he tried everything. I thought this is an interesting story, even if it's not historically true my, you know, as well, I find, is that he tried all the spiritual paths and practices of the day and ultimately felt like none of them really quite got it, you know? So he told himself, I'm just going to sit down under this Bodhi tree until I get it and I'm not going to go anywhere, I'm not going to do anything, essentially. The, 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 the story is supposedly is he lived on a hemp seed a day, which is a sort of an interesting little connection. Um, uh, I don't think any of that's meant to be taken completely literally, but um, when he finally uh, recognized his true nature, apparently, as the story goes, somebody asked him, how do you know? And he put his hand on the earth and said, this solid earth is my witness. It's as simple as that. It's like, there's, it's not a theory, not a dogma, it's not a concept, it's not a belief, uh, it's not even an individual experience. It's just a recognition of who you are uh, connected to everything somehow. Um, and so cannabis, because of the amplification effect that it has, that it potentially has, well, it does, period, I guess, uh, if you channel that amplified energy, that, that enhanced energy, then it can deepen your presence in the moment. It's challenging for most of us to do that, just in the same way that it's actually challenging to sit down, shut up, and pay attention completely straight for half an hour. I mean, uh, you know, I don't think there are too many people around, apart from perhaps Eckhart Tolle, <laughs> who can <laughs> sit still for um, half an hour to an hour and barely have a thought, you know. Um, most of us, the thoughts are coming and going, you know. And so with cannabis involved in the practice, that can actually be uh, the, the tendency or the pull, I guess you could say, of thoughts and ideas can be even more compelling and stronger. And just simply because of the same theory or, well, I would say reality, but, you know, uh, principle, that the thinking mind is the way we obscure that unconditioned reality. If you take cannabis while you're doing your practices, it ups the stakes. So that challenge to let go is like you're letting go into a potentially deeper space, and we recognize that even if we don't recognize it consciously. So the more you know, like I said with the octopus, you know, the only time it actually sends out the ink cloud and tries to hide is when it's afraid. So that's in a situation of threat. And the ego is always warding off threats or wanting to ward off threats. So uh, if you raise the stakes and it becomes a little more apparent, I mentioned last night Jeremy Wolf from the book saying, uh, pot leaves you naked and the first thing you see is yourself, right? So if you if, uh, if you've amplified this, this, you know, the irritation of enlightenment, you know, so to speak, then ego kind of goes, oh, my God, you know, must stop this, must shut it down, must ignore it, must avoid it. So it can actually be more challenging. And that's why some experts in, you know, who, in terms of people who've worked with cannabis, with deep spiritual work, say it's an advanced spiritual medicine because you're actually 
working at a, a, a raised stakes level, a higher, more highly energized level with your meditation. So perhaps, uh, I mean, that was a long, uninterrupted rant, so perhaps you'd like to ask another question or carry on to something different. Well, I think uh, the first thing uh, that I was thinking about related to cannabis is yeah. how most people think about it, mm. and that is recreational. Yes. And so the very first thing that I think um, people who are new to the idea uh, mm -hmm. of cannabis being spiritual yeah. is the idea that they've never heard of this before. It's yeah. always been kind of something that uh, you just do for fun. Uh, what's what's some of the differences in... I guess this will relate to set and setting. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the differences in how cannabis can have an effect on you related to what you're involved in, uh, what your mindset is, what your intention is, mm -hmm. related to often people think about it as something, if, if anything other than just for fun, it's related to creativity mm -hmm. and music and art. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you just talk a little bit about set and setting with sure. that. And in particular, if you could think about or if you could talk a little bit about how often what is a minimum and, and what is a what is what is a minimum and maximum amount of, mm -hmm. of doing it and, and how much for yeah. example yeah I understand yeah go there's it. a few questions in there mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, your first one was the difference between sort of using it spiritually or not spiritually or what you called recreationally um, it's a it's a it's a it's a kind of complex uh, there's no real simple answer to that I don't think so-called recreational use is not necessarily a problem, not that you said it was, but it depends on the person and how they use it. Um, it. This amplification effect does give people a sense of potentially deeper pleasure, deeper connection to things, and they may never think of that as spiritual, but maybe it is, even though they don't ever think of that term, you know, and that's that's fine, you know. I, th I kind of think that everybody, there's nothing else going on other than the spiritual journey is kind of the way I think of life, you know. Whether you ever have the actual concept of that or not, everybody wants something, you know. Um, and basically, underneath it all, everybody wants to, you know, relax. Everyone wants to be at peace. Everyone wants to feel good, you know, to feel, you know, comfortable and happy, you know. Who doesn't want to be happy, really, you know? Not too many people, you know. Um, uh, so, but most of us don't understand the mechanics of that, so we tend to look for it outside of ourselves, you know. And so cannabis can be problematic in a way if you're looking for, you know, anything that's going to last outside of yourself. Cannabis can also kind of fit into that category. However, as I was saying a moment ago, it, it can also be... I would say spiritually beneficial if you never think of it as a spiritual practice still depending on how you manage it in your life but th this to me is the most I mean there's a lot of things one could say about this but this to me is the most important one where there's really a big difference is um, and this is just true of you know our minds in general but again amplified with cannabis and also when we're thinking of it as an ally or a spiritual you know helper so to speak is that if you can give your full attention to it you know if you can quiet the thoughts down to a degree anyway because it is challenging and just really pay attention to it and let your breath let yourself relax into it then for one thing people often I even find that and I've been working with the plant for a long time if I'm doing something like reading or even listening to music or playing the guitar or something like that and then I stop and just sit in silence I will often suddenly go wow this was actually a lot stronger than I felt it a few moments ago so it has this power that you can miss that's what I was saying earlier you know unlike say ayahuasca which is like you were coming with me you know <laughs> um, uh, cannabis again depending on dosage of course and I will answer that question um, uh, uh, cannabis you can skirt around those uh, you know that power that depth if you fill your mind and if you you know 
push, put activity in the way. You might find it very mild. And then if you were to stop and just stand or sit or lie down or whatever uh, and do nothing, which again is why you know, meditation has been held in such high regard by traditions like Buddhism because it's not that it's a totally different thing than the rest of your life. It's just a more focused or disciplined way to allow yourself to be in the now and recognize that, you know, and recognize what's getting in the way of it. So if you um, can calm things down and not have external things going on around you with cannabis, then you start to see potentially that its depth and its power and its um, beneficence, I think I would say too, in a really sharper, clearer, um, and uh, what's the word, um, uh, enriching way. Uh, it's a very kind plant. So you mentioned the phrase set and setting. Set, of course, is the intention for that to happen, uh, you know, put in the most simple terms, and then the setting is where you do it, you know. And cannabis is more um, flexible than, in my view, anyway, than some of the quote-unquote stronger entheogens. You know, I wouldn't just take ayahuasca. I would only do it in a, you know, with a guide or in a ceremony or something like that. Cannabis, you can have a, a, a couple of tokes in the woods by yourself. You know, it's very safe and easy to work with that way. But that's setting. You know, you're still putting yourself in a place. I would say ideally where. You don't have to think about much, you know, you don't have to deal with driving or getting into conversations about any old thing, you know, or kids running through the room. Not that, uh, you know, that, <laughs> that might be really good too, you know, but uh, uh, mothers sometimes say, you know, that it's made them a better mother because they can kind of get down to the level of their kid and enjoy playing with them, you know. But um, in terms of working with cannabis as a spiritual, a spiritually opening uh, medicine, um, uh, just kind of uh, quieting things down, simplifying things, being in a place where you feel safe, you don't have to think about that, you know, is somebody going to, you know, is there any threat or distract, disturbance here? Uh, and again, as I say, that could be in the woods, and like I wouldn't just take ayahuasca alone in the woods, you know, personally, or, you know, I wouldn't anyway. Uh, so setting really important, and then uh, those other questions that you mentioned about uh, dosage, for example, and frequency of use. Um, there's a theme that a number of the contributors to the book have addressed, which is that it, not always, but it can be a case, case of less is more. And that can refer to both the dosage and the frequency of use. So what I suggest to people who are not familiar with the effects of cannabis, particularly if they're giving it that kind of, atten of attention where it can feel quite a bit stronger than if you're just, you know, whatever, hanging around with your friends and chatting constantly and got the music going and, what you know, whatever, um, you start to notice how strong and clear it is. And so um, if you're sensitive, if you're not used to that, uh, if you're new, newer to the plant, uh, I would say start with a very small dose and, and also get to know the medicine. Like, don't just take any old medicine. Uh, find out what medicine you're dealing with. Uh, ideally, getting it from somebody who knows that medicine really well, whether it's a dispensary or, you know, whatever it is. But going to people who know what their know what their medicine is, and they can say, "Oh yeah, well, we, you know, the feedback about this one is this. You know, it's got a sharp edge to it. It's very calming. It's, you know, it lasts a long time. It, you know, it comes on hard and disappears quickly. Whatever, you know." Um, and, and, oh, and by the way, it's got 20% THC in it, so, you know, go easy <laughs> at first. Or, or this one here, you know, it's 5% THC and 12% CBD, so it's going to be gentle, and the CBD actually is going to mitigate the, 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 uh, the, the, the high of the THC. So you might find that a really good place to start with. So knowing the strains is really important, or could be very important for people and uh, starting with a small dose if you're not used to it. Um, this doesn't apply to people who are using the cannabis plant daily because there is a tolerance effect, of course, and, uh, and a familiarity effect. You know, if you're waking up in the morning, wake and bake style, uh, and, you know, doing that two or three times during the day, then you're actually more in, in, in the cannabinized state than you are in the, you know, non-inebriated, uh, so to speak, state. 
And so, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is not relevant to those people in terms of dosage, you know, they need more, you know, typically, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the issue of frequency is a really interesting one because you could say that just being in the zone, so to speak, is spiritual. If this plant calms you down a little and allows you to be more present, uh, or even just to appreciate the moment more, that's spiritual. Uh, and if that works for you to be using cannabis daily, who am I to say? It's not me to say, that, not my position to say that that's not spiritual or beneficial to you. Uh, however, there's two issues, I think, about that. One is that there can be an unhealthy dependency that develops, and many people would acknowledge that that's happened to themselves or they've seen it around them. And that can be counterproductive. Uh, and, you, you know, as uh, Kathleen Harrison in the book says, she's seen people who, young men in particular, she said, that in her personal experience, um, including some people she's known very well, uh, get lost in that state where it's like this kind of teddy bear almost, you know, and they don't want to come out of it. You know, they, they feel kind of, you know, it's like the cocoon that I was talking about. They think it's a good place to be, but they're, they're actually losing their way. Uh, they're uh, resistant or in denial about coming back out into full engagement with the world, you know, what she calls the daylight world of relationship and responsibility. So there's definitely a potential downside for frequency of use. That's one thing. And the other one is that uh, the, is the familiarity tolerance effect. So several of the contributors to the book talk about, well, a couple in particular, and one in particular is really clear about it, Mariano da Silva, who is an ayahuasca, ayahuascaro, ayahuasca shaman, and also very, very knowledgeable and skilled with using cannabis as a spiritual medicine. And he said that cannabis can, uh, I forget which verb he used, introduce you or open you up into transcendental realms if you really know how to use it but that if he does it every day, all that kind of effect disappears. And that's the does same thing. Does not happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't, I found that any more than once a week, yes. you don't get the depth experience. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think for people who are serious about trying, finding out what cannabis can do that way, if you can, and of course there are, you know, millions of people that need it daily for medicinal reasons, uh, and, and some people who are just not going to be able to do that anyway and still lead effective lives. I know people like that. Uh, it actually, uh, I mentioned again uh, last night that one descriptor for cannabis is that it's, it, it's a home, it creates a condition of homeostatic balance. It um, uh, resolves the fight or flight mechanisms of the parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, uh, glands or whatever it is function in the uh, auto autonomic nervous system into one um, so there's a balance there uh, what Joan Bello calls a charged equilibrium and one particular person I know who's brilliant uh, academic scholar uh, and the opposite of any kind of a lazy slacker or unmotivated or spacey or anything like that uh, uses cannabis two or three times a day and I asked him why or how that works for him and he said it just takes that he's you know he's an intense kind of person you know potential for anger potential for a level of anxiety and it just takes enough of that off just sort of smooths off the edges of that just enough that he can focus and so it puts him in the right place as he feels so I can't argue with that uh, even though the Stellar's J up there might have different opinions um, or whatever they are. Uh, anyway, um, uh, however, again, if you can, I think what we're talking about perhaps once a week or, I don't know, I'm, I personally have difficulty leaving it alone for a full week, but I also am motivated enough by that issue or principle that I, I, I don't do it every day and I rarely do it every second day, usually give it at least three or four days in between time and then often try to do it in a 
quiet, meditative way. Kathleen Harrison in the book says she almost always does cannabis alone so that she can just connect with the moment, connect with nature, connect with her plants that she's growing, connect, you know, whatever. You know, connect, connect, connect kind of idea. Yeah. Yeah, people can definitely experiment, try mm -hmm. different amounts, different times, and that yeah. kind of stuff. I think uh, for me, what I found is uh, any more than once a week, you don't get the deep experience. However, oh. uh, that may not be what is uh, valuable for you at the time. Um, your first experience, your first experience is can your first or second experience can likely be among the best you ever have, mm. and you may begin looking for that again. And as you increase the the uh, the quantity mm -hmm. of times that you do it, then yeah. you lose that out. Um, however, diminishing returns, is diminishing one way returns. To think of that. Yeah, and yeah. so. In that respect, it's uh, sometimes a, a good idea to go without it for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's everyone's in a different spot, yes. um, and they're even on the spiritual, uh, even for the spiritual element, there are many uh, different benefits mm -hmm. at different points in your life, and yeah. uh, and of course, everyone's different. Yeah. So I think uh, this will lead us to our last topic of the real value of cannabis and I, I guess the first thing uh, I'm thinking about is the um, Joe Rogan often talk, talks about how it makes him a better person mm -hmm. uh, and you were talking about the amplifying effect yeah. you begin to realize the way you treat other people mm -hmm. you begin to realize the way you treat yourself yeah. uh, how judgment judgmental you are of yourself yeah, of so others he, yeah. and this is the naked thing that the uh, naked yeah Jeremy Wolf was talking about seeing yourself yeah and uh, that can be a beautiful experience and this would relate to the the last topic of enlightenment mm -hmm. we can begin by defining it however we like it but i think being at uh i define it very different than what i'm going to talk about right now but being at at peace with um mm -hmm. with yourself mm -hmm. uh and uh existence itself mm -hmm. is is part of what is so valuable about um, the enlightened experience. Just briefly, I'm, I'm just going to kind of define enlightenment and then I'll let you kind of uh, define it if you like to. Uh, I find it just, it's, it's very simple, the recognition of uh, the profoundness of our existence. And sometimes we forget we have it, that experience. Uh, various mm -hmm. people call it Satori and various levels of it and there's other words. Uh, Satori and, is more like an actual specific peak experience of enlightenment uh, rather than an ongoing condition. And that's yeah. where, yeah, uh, and then so there are all kinds of ways to describe this. Uh, and then over time, it's the ability to create that yourself and uh, not be uh, the experience, the the uh, the realization is so vivid that you're able to deal with uh, the various challenges of life in a much different way. Mm -hmm. And in general, you see a very uh, you, you see the spectrum. You see the context of of uh, of all of existence, including whatever specific yeah. thing you're you're doing. Uh, and then. I'll let you talk a little bit about whatever thoughts kind of come to your mind there yeah. uh, and related to sure. cannabis. And then we'll move into kind of a, a global enlightenment, what, what cannabis and that yeah. kind of stuff can do for us. Well, I, I think I could maybe even combine those into two questions or to, you know, to those two questions into one kind of theme. Um, I don't know that we even really need to, for, for most people, if we're talking about a global consciousness shift, we don't necessarily even need to really use the word enlightenment that much or at least refer to the ultimate state of total enlightenment because um, there are degrees of awakening that can be make a huge difference in individual and collective life and it's it's you alluded to, to it in your in your monologue a moment ago there that the um, there is a way to move through the world which is much less struggling, much less effortful. Um, it's actually 
it doesn't mean you don't work hard or you know aren't passionate or anything it just means that there isn't the same level of uh, um, t entangled conflict and stress and the blocking of energy this is really important one right uh, disease is described oftentimes by you know the sort of newer thinking and also older indigenous kind of thinking uh, or understanding I mean as um, uh, what develops when energy is not moving you know when it becomes blocked and that has um, that has to do with stress with uh, wounds that you've taken on from your earlier in your life and so on and so on so uh, what what's really possible for a huge number of human beings is to begin to just relax and slow down. Slowing down is really, really important. And when I say slow down, I don't just mean walking slower or something like that. I mean slowing down the speed of mind so that you enter more into the moment. And then things start to fall into place. You find that you're more skillful. You know, like you've probably noticed, and most people probably have, that if you're speedy, if you're worried, you're less skillful. You're much more likely to trip make mistakes, say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, act too quickly or not quickly enough because you're, you're not flowing, you're not relaxed, you're not fully there. When you calm down and pay attention, then you start seeing things that you didn't see before. You get little intuitions, you get little guidance things going on. Um, David Lynch, I just read a short interview with him about the remake they're doing now of uh, Twin Peaks, you know, and he was saying when you pay attention, things happen that you never expected, and you, if you're open about it, you can incorporate them into what you're doing. They, this, they had a, a set decorator moving a bed in this room, and uh, uh, somehow, this is the short version of the story, Lynch just was sitting there, he had no ideas in his mind, he was just watching this happen, and he thought, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to ask that guy if he's ever done any acting. And he said, yeah, I've done a little bit. And he said, okay, I'm going to put you in this scene. You know, just that kind of idea that, uh, that we can spontaneously bring our intelligence into the moment if we're not constantly trying to shore things up and control them and, you know, judge what we can do and can't do and what should happen and shouldn't happen and, you know, have these agendas in our heads and go around in this kind of somewhat stressed, speedy-minded, busy-minded way all the time. So if we can just slow things down mentally, then we start to see there the, old, the whole world starts to open up in a totally different way. And we become much more intelligent and skillful, potentially. And, and I think that might be a good place to end because that's the way that cannabis can help us because that it can actually uh, show us as an energy medicine that we can be in that present state. If we can get out of our heads as much as possible, let the breathing expand, expansion thing happens that can happen with cannabis, and settle down and slow the speed of mind down. Joan Bellow talks about it, how it slows attentional shifts. Some people might say, what? It just speeds my mind up, but that's not understanding it properly. That's not knowing how to work with the plant. So I think if, 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 if there's one thing in general that cannabis can do is it can bring calmness and slowness of mind and peace into human individual work and to human affairs altogether. Well, thank you very much. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about where we can uh, find you? Uh, tell Always us your website, a, a, uh, your books, that sure. kind of stuff. Always an appreciated question, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I have a website, uh, cannabisandspirituality.com, and a Facebook group, uh, f uh, Cannabis and Spirituality. And I want to say that I uh, really encourage people to contribute to that. I'm very open to people sending me material that I could just look over, maybe do a little editing on, and then put on as a blog post on my website that would stay there permanently, and or um, sending me uh, uh, posts that I can put on the Facebook group as well, which, as we all know, although they don't disappear, they quickly recede into the distance as more stuff piles on in front of it. But uh, in both cases, I, 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 I really um, keen to have people contribute uh, uh, and share their experiences through these media. And so, yeah, that's the main thing. Um, yeah, that's all I need to say. People can contact me. There's a there's a contact uh, place on the on the website if they want to contact me directly. And 
if they have something interesting to ask or say, I'm generally pretty good about responding. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to explore these issues. I think they're very valuable. Yeah. Okay.